to hear the papa cheer As we play the characters that you cheer So join us as we go, go, go Below the frame on this episode of Below the Frame, we'll be talking with the members of the Sesame Street Mentorship Program. We'll talk about who they are, what they've gotten to do on Sesame Street, and they'll even share some tips with you. We're also learning about improvisation and puppetry, so name an interesting profession. It's time to go Below the Frame. Go, go, go Below the Frame. Welcome to Below the Frame. My name is Matt Vogel. We have a super fun and very interesting show for you today because we don't just have one guest that I'm going to interview, nor do we have two. We have seven. That's right, seven people that we're going to get to hear from today. They are a group of puppeteers who are part of the Sesame Street Mentorship Program. Uh, a bit of history about that. I, uh, on Sesame Street, I'm the puppet captain, which uh, is a fancy title. But what it really means is that I, I do things like... Uh, I sit in on production meetings and help come up with ways to shoot things from a Muppet standpoint. I also cast the Muppet performers in right hand as an assisting uh, and one-time character roles across Sesame's various projects. And on top of all of that, it is my job to look at who's out there in the world puppeteer-wise. So we hold puppeteer workshops at Sesame Workshop on a pretty routine basis. And, and out of these workshops... The seven that I mentioned before, for the most part, were chosen from those workshops to be part of the mentorship program. And the program started in 2017 with a goal of deepening our bench of performers. We began with four members, and we have been adding people every season since then. And they're a group of, of really great people with a lot of diverse interests and talents, and they're so smart and so hardworking, and they're just they're good people, and they, they also have a lot to say. So we should get right to that, because I am ready. How about you? Good. Okay, then, let's do this. Let's go below the frame with the Sesame Street mentees. Please welcome the mentees of Sesame Street, Tao Bennett, Austin Costello, Chris Thomas Hayes, Haley Jenkins, Kathy Kim, Spencer Lott, Megan Pyfus, and there is one other member of the Sesame mentees, Lara McLean, but uh, she was featured on the Wrangler episode of Below the Frame, episode five, and she told her story at length there. So we, we don't really need to hear from her again, right, guys? Nah. nah. <laughs> She's had her time. That's right. That's right. She's had her time. How is everybody? Pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Pretty good. Getting in there, yeah. Pretty good. Great. Yeah. Excellent. I've got some questions. Uh, this should be easy. But to start, I just I want to let people listening know a little bit about who you, who you are. And um, to do that... Uh, I'll call you out, and if you could just please give us a little bio about who you are, maybe where you came from, what brought you to puppetry, any any pertinent, important information that you'd like people to know. All right, so I'm going to start with you, Austin. Cool. Yeah, so hey, this is Austin Costello. I grew up on Long Island as a massive, massive Muppet geek, um, as Marty Robinson calls me, a Muppet geek. <laughs> like people know the stats of the baseball player or something like that. I knew the stats of the Muppet performers. I knew, oh yeah, that's Frank Oz. He's Grover and Yoda, who's not a Muppet, and Miss Piggy and Cookie and all them. And uh, grew up watching the Muppet Show on on a local channel that would play and and starting building puppets when I was in middle school. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew I was still watching Sesame Street. So I should either go that way or grow up. And I decided I'm not going to grow up. I want to do Sesame Street. And uh, thank God we're here. So uh, I came from a background of just being a Muppet fan. Didn't know anything about acting or puppetry, but by watching uh, and learning, I picked up lip sync and eye focus and all that fun. Started practicing on a clunky old video camera that my dad gave me. Uh, my dad and mom, they did community theater and security work for the movies. So I think that my puppetry is kind of a zenith of doing behind the scenes work and performance work. So that's in my blood somewhere. But I'm yeah. a Yukon guy, I'm an O'Neill guy, and I'm really glad to be a mentee now. I mean, what a rare opportunity. Cool. Thanks, Austin. Megan? Hey, hey everyone. I'm Megan. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I currently live in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I grew up in uh, the church around a lot of music, a lot of great people and community. And when I was probably about 10 years old, a lady um, at my church who taught children's ministry, um, she would use puppets to teach us 
different Bible stories and songs. And she had to been the worst puppeteer there ever was. <laughs> and she knew she was bad. <laughs> so she got a group of kids together to go to a conference to learn how to do puppetry and how to be a team together too. And so that was my first exposure to puppetry at an international conference for puppetry and ventriloquism. We didn't realize ventriloquism was going to be there until we got there. And so I was already kind of amazed by puppetry. I grew up playing with them. Like I played with Barbie dolls, but <laughs> Never, nothing ever serious for performance. And so I was exposed to people singing with puppets. And as someone growing up around music with whose father was a musician, I was immediately drawn with the imagination of singing through a character. And so by that point, I hadn't really gained the confidence to even sing by myself. <laughs> and so I picked it up when I got home. I told my parents I wanted to learn ventriloquism, got a, a good little puppet to practice with and learn from uh, library videos, VHS videos <laughs> on how to do ventriloquism. And um show up my friends at school and um, the teachers notice. And after that, I did my first performance at a school devotional, wrote my own little script. And from there, I was just in love with the idea of coming up with a conversation with a puppet. And that's one of the things that I love about Sesame Street is the interaction between the human and the puppet. Um, it's two magical worlds blended together. Um, so that's how I started your Christian conference and it just never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Haley? Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much, Matt, for doing this, by the way. This is awesome. <laughs> this is really exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm Haley Jenkins. Uh, I was born and raised in Matthews, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. I still have a little bit of the accent when I'm tipsy or talking to my grandma. <laughs> <laughs> my background uh, really isn't in puppets at all. I, I loved them. I, I had a lot of puppets I loved playing with, but I didn't, wa I didn't grow up watching the Muppets or knowing anything about the Muppets. I had I loved um, the Muppet Family Christmas and Muppet Vision 3D in Disney World, and that was all I had of Muppets. I didn't watch the show. I, I went to school up in, uh, in Pittsburgh at Point Park University for musical theater because I thought I'm going to be on Broadway. And, uh, <laughs> and I got there and I loved it and it was wonderful, but it just, something was missing. And what ultimately brought me to puppetry was that there was an audition to do the college program down in Disney World. And at the audition, they had, uh, you know, dancing character stuff, and then they had a puppetry portion. And then they also had a Power Rangers audition. <laughs> and I, at the time, I was like really into like fitness and martial arts stuff. And, uh, and so I auditioned for both. And, um, and I got into both. I got into the puppetry department of Disney World, and then also... I was in line to, to be trained as a pink Power Ranger. But then when I got down to Disney World, they accidentally uh, scheduled both things at the same time. I talked to my scheduling person. I was like, wait, how, what do I do? And she's like, oh, just choose one. You'll do the other one down the road. And I was like, well, I'm going to do puppetry. That sounds cool. And then I never became a Power Ranger. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Haley. Yeah. Chris. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Uh, what's up, folks? <laughs> I can't get over that. I love that. Um, I'm uh, Chris Thomas Hayes. I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I grew up watching uh, for, uh, Lamb Chop and Sesame Street and Gerber. Um, everything. It's anything puppet stuff I loved a lot. Studied high, um, musical theater when I was in high school and theater in general. And then I went to the um, Hart School of Music in West Hartford. And then after some money issues, uh, transferred <clears throat> to Berea College on full scholarship in Kentucky. And I did theater there as well. Um, while I was there, I would have flashbacks of, as a kid, uh, traveling to Atlanta to visit my father and going to the Center for Poetry Arts and rem just remembering how amazing those shows were and watching the puppeteers come in and out of it and watching how Jim Henson cut the rope on the uh, the first day and back in the 70s. And I was like, what? <laughs> and um, while I was in college, I was like, man, maybe puppets. Maybe that's my spot. Maybe that's where I can find a niche to kind of explore and jump off. And after college, I um, went on tour, moved to Cincinnati. 
I walked into Mad Cat Puppets like one random day. They weren't auditioning. I just walked in and said, hey, you guys hiring puppeteers? And they said, no. <laughs> and I said, take my car, take my resume. I, I can really do this. And they said, okay. And then months later, I thought I was, I graduated college. My mom had the car packed. She was like, are you coming back home? And I was like, I think I'm just going to chill here and figure, see if something falls my way. And so I hung out in Kentucky for maybe like a month. And then my phone rang and it was a Mad Cat Puppets. They said, hey, random guy who came in, we're actually having auditions. And so I auditioned um, and got in. And I went on the road for like, it was, for like the, almost 10 years just doing shows and school puppet shows here and there and there and then all over the place. And then after doing that for a while, I decided I was going to move to Atlanta of all places. I have family down here. Uh, and I just decided it was my time to go try to re-audition at the Center for Puppetry Arts, like take the, take the throne at the place where I had been watching for so long. And um, I walked in, they knew who all my former directors were. They had familiar with Mac and puppets and I just started working there and learning everything I could. And um, that basically led me up to um, the workshops, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but that's, that's a Ooh, very that's quick a good idea. Me. I better write that down. Ooh, write that I down. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks Chris. Uh, thanks. Uh, Tao. Uh, hi, I'm Tao Bennett. I, uh, whew, let's see. It's such an <laughs> interesting story. Well, okay. So my puppetry interest started very early on. I was watching the Muppets and Sesame Street since as long as I can remember. My entire family kind of was always watching. My dad watched it as a kid. My mom watched it. In fact, they were the first generation of Sesame Street watchers. And uh, I also watch a lot of TV and movies. I love, you know, character stuff. And I, I guess mix in with my interest in the Muppets and one, and you know, the curiosity of how they were built and how they were manipulated. I also wanted to be a performer and, you know, watching all those classic comedies from long before I was born, long before I was even a thought, those things really interested me. And so I, I wanted to do that stuff, but I knew that like, you know, I'm not, I look the way I look and I'm, you know, it's a very specific thing that I could do. So, but with puppets, it's different. You could do anything with puppets. You can be any character you want to be. So I, I guess somehow I was aware of that at an early age and kind of just put all of my energy into learning that so that I could be that performer and play those characters while looking the way I look and not having to be seen at all, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks, Tao. Uh, Spencer. Hey, I'm so happy to be here, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Lott. I'm a Kansas kid. I think like like you, Matt. Yeah. And I I was a PBS kid first of all, so I grew up watching Sesame Street, um, the the puppets on Shining Time Station, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, all these great kind of a wide variety of style of puppets that were all happening at that time. Um, and I've, so I've got a kindergarten paper that says, I want to be the next Jim Henson. Um, <laughs> and I've got incredible, I had uh, incredible teachers and incredible parents who uh, said yes, who, who, who encouraged my love of puppetry and said, okay, if you want to do this, then you, you, should, you should get good at it. And so I took sculpting classes and dance classes and um, acting and just kind of started to cultivate my artist toolbox and then, like, you know, so many things, when people find out you're into one thing, then they encourage it. And so I started getting puppets for gifts, uh, you know, for birthday presents or um, like the, one of the big ones for me was the, the No Strings Attached book, the Jim Henson Creature Shop book. You remember that? The giant like hardcover yeah. one? And so for, from like first grade on, um, if you asked me what I wanted to be, I would I, I want to be a Jim Henson Workshop animatronic puppeteer. <laughs> It's like such a brat thing to say, but it was like the longest job title I could possibly think of, and it was and it was in it was in Hollywood. It was making magic. It was, it was one part robots and one part puppetry, and it was you know a little bit sciency. And so I was just obsessed with it. Um, and then uh, my my family, my my uncle is a kind of photographer, filmmaker, and he had these old Cinefix magazines. And so we go over to my uncle's house and just pull off all these Cinefix and just pour through all these like and then so from an early age I love like behind the scenes uh, and so puppetry like kind of kind of scratched that itch for me mm. um, 
And so, but it, but I was growing up in Kansas, and so they weren't making movies next door. There was nothing happening <laughs> locally, <laughs> but there was a local puppet company, the Paul Mesner Puppets, who were doing rod, like traditional rod puppet style. So I got in with them, and on a you know take your kid to work day, I would go work with Paul for a day, and and started learning this like traditional rod puppet style and how to how he built them and how he toured shows and all those things. Um, so then when I was in high school, I started my own company. And I found that I could make, doing one library show on one Saturday morning, I could make more money than all my buddies who were mowing lawns for a month. <laughs> um, and so it was, my, it was the first moment to say, like, oh, this is, this is fun. I, I get to do what I love to do and they'll pay me for it. <clears throat> um, and so I started, I started from there. I went, I went to University of Kansas. I couldn't afford UConn. I really, really wanted to go to UConn, but I, I couldn't afford it. So I went to the state school and got a general theater and film degree. But the cool thing about that program was that I got to kind of customize my curriculum. So I took uh, costume design, improv, directing, Greek and Roman myth, Muslim studies of the Old Testament. Like I got to take a wide swath of, of things, which, which was also good for my artist toolbox. And because my parents saved so much money going to state school, then I got to go to the O'Neill and I got to go to P of A regional and national festivals every summer. So that kind of became, you know, a, 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 a puzzle piece to my kind of puppetry education. Um, so it's, it's, it's all support. It's all, I've been very, very fortunate to have incredible, incredible support the whole time. Yeah. Thanks, Spencer. And Kathy. Hi, everybody. My name is <laughs> Kathy Kim. I am a late bloomer to puppetry. I feel like there's like two schools. Either you come out of the womb being like, this is for me, or you kind of like, it happens at you, kind of like Haley's story. I am the latter. I grew up in New York, uh, in Queens, uh, and then in Long Island. And I'm a PBS kid like Spencer, Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers, all that stuff, and love the Muppets growing up. And I guess I like dabbled in puppetry here and there, but it never, ever occurred to me that it's something that I could pursue. I had like, you know, traditional Korean immigrant parents who like, they wouldn't even let me go out for drama or theater. They're like, it's a waste of time. It doesn't even look good on college applications. It's not for you. I'm like, okay. But, you know, in, inspired by Sesame Street, which was such a big influence in my early childhood. I mean, I, I, we didn't speak English growing up in my house. And so I, learned English, <laughs> you know, watching Sesame Street. And uh, inspired by that, I wanted to go into children's television and production. Again, puppets, that normal people don't get to do that. It wasn't even like a thought in my mind. But if someone said, hey, what's a fun fact about you? What's your dream job? I would have said Muppeteer, but it's like, yeah, it would also be nice to play for the NBA or go into space. Sure, I'd love to be a Muppeteer, <laughs> you know? And so uh, ended up at Nickelodeon as a PA, my first job. Big recession happened 2008-9, and I had to kind of find work, ended up being in reality TV, which I still kind of do. And my husband at the time uh, was doing a lot of improv at the UCB Theater in New York. And uh, he's like, hey, you like puppets? I'm like, yeah. It's like, let's take this class. It's called Puppetry for Improv Performers. I'm like, that sounds like a silly fun thing to do. <laughs> and it was. And uh, the teacher is this builder performer named David Fino. And I guess he uh, saw something in me because uh, he would then take me on different projects or, or shoots that he was on as his assist. And that's kind of how I learned how to do monitor stuff. Definitely got stories of bad, bad early days <laughs> of learning on the job. But a lot of his students, they let me know about the 2014 workshop. And surely every time I'd go on a gig, I think like, well, that was fun. I got to live my dream on the weekend, but back to normal, like reality, literally reality TV, back to reality. And I said I wasn't going to apply because there's no way I could get in and it will just be too crushing for me. But the night before, I had this thought of like, if these guys get in, I know I'm better than them. I will never forgive myself. <laughs> so at the night before the deadline, I sent in a tape, got in, and then, yeah, a few years later, got accepted into this really awesome mentorship program, which has been a dream come true. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, everybody. Those are great stories. I mean, and you're right, Kathy, you said something, you know, there's kind of two schools here where people kind of come out knowing in some way, they're like, I've got to do this thing. And then some people just kind of find it. And then they think, 
I've got to do this thing. We do have a very diverse group of uh, U-mentees that have a lot of diverse interests, which I think is great. We talked about education a little bit. Austin went to UConn. Anybody else go to like a specific puppetry education? Uh, Just yeah. Austin, I mean, you, Tal, I don't what do you, you, what do you call have? It like, well, there was this thing that Michael Earl taught back in 2011, um, the late, great Michael Earl. He had this like monitor class that he would teach in uh, Manhattan. And I was like a kid among adults. I was like 11 among like 30 to however else old year olds taking these like that was the first time i tried monitor stuff was that like a weekly thing uh yeah um i forget how many weeks it was but it was a few weeks of just workshopping camera and monitor work and they you know they you would bring your own puppets or they had puppets provided for you and yeah it was actually very not intense it's actually very low stakes but it, it, there was something about it that was like oh this is this it feels real like like i'm doing something that like i'm i'm learning from it you know any other monitor uh, observations. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, it was weird when I first started doing it because I've been doing theater puppetry for so freaking long. I was like, I got this. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, it was the summer before I went and met my wife. Uh, Steve Whitmire came to the center and did, um, he did a monitor night just teaching um, the folks how to do monitor stuff. And we were like, oh, <laughs> all right, let's see this. Hands went up in the air. We was like, I've, I've never done a puppet before. <laughs> nothing, nothing would work. I was like, I don't know. He did one for kind of like general audiences. And then he did another one uh, like a week later for just the puppeteers at the center. And he had this rig set up that would blink a light around the frame. And you were supposed to look at the, at the lights. You were like, oh my God, I'm trying to focus. And my arm is shaking because my hand's over my head. So that was, yeah, that was just learning curve was insane. Yeah, it is. It's one of the things that you, you have to get in order to do what we're, what we're doing. Yukon. Austin, can you talk a little bit about Yukon and the kind of puppetry that you learned there? Sure. The Yukon program is absolutely amazing. And the program, I don't know if it was Jen Barnhart or Pam Arciero that talked about it here on Below the Frame, so go back and listen to it. Plug in the show. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there we have it. Go listen. It's great. They're great, great friends. They're already <laughs> listening to it, though, Austin. Oh, yeah. So yeah, good. Then you people should keep listening to it. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you, Kathy. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, you don't want them so to anyhow, interrupt. You don't want them to stop now. Right. No, in the don't middle stop of this now. One. No, we're, we're in the middle go. of something. Matt asked me something. Right. Give Matt the yeah, respect, yeah. if not yeah, me. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so anyhow, um, Frank Ballard was an incredible um, puppeteer and a teacher. Uh, and the program was very marionette and rod puppet heavy, from what I've been told. When I was there in 2011 to 2015, uh, the program, again, under Bart Rockaburton, uh, we did absolutely everything. Uh, there were marionette courses uh, that ran for the full year. It was first marionette performance, then marionette construction, because the thought was that you have to understand how gravity and the puppet work together before you can come up with your own fully crafted marionette from scratch. Uh, there is a monitor class, which Bart says is devoted to Muppetry. And when I was there, uh, Marty Robinson came in to teach four weeks of it, which was crazy, crazy cool. I had known wow. Marty since I was 13 or so. He came in to teach, which was crazy cool. Um, there were shadow puppet courses. There's uh, American Puppet History, which runs from the time that, uh, I guess, settlers hit our continent uh, up until us writing our own 10-year plan as our final paper. Uh, so we really covered absolutely everything. And uh, when I auditioned for the program, my, my professor, this guy Bart, was t saying, uh, make sure you learn more than Muppet stuff because it's important. You know, you don't just leave UConn and go right to work for Sesame Street or something. There are a thousand avenues uh, that you can do and learning rod puppetry and shadow puppetry and even puppet history. Everything is so important. So what did we learn at UConn? Everything. Very cool, Austin. Yeah. Spencer, yeah. you were talking about Paul Messner in Kansas City. I actually worked with Paul Messner before moving to New York, and we did, uh, we did rod puppets. Tell me about rod puppetry and your experience with Paul Messner just a little bit more, if you could. So working with Paul was incredible because he was, uh, he was a Midwestern artist who started in his basement and then grew this company, created a nonprofit, had a board, and built a building and would uh, you know collaborate with other professional and regional theaters around the community. So it was a great example example of someone locally doing something that I could identify with or something that I might look to. 
and he does this kind of traditional rod puppet style, which is kind of you know very almost uh, almost an American kind of style. The shorter rods, two or three feet long, usually made out of oak. Um, and working for him, I I got to learn from top to bottom how to make them, what makes a good rod puppet, what makes a bad rod puppet. As a as a performer there, we would go through his repertoires, all the shows that he developed, and so he'd pull up a box and he'd say, "We're going to do Rapunzel this year, but this Rapunzel is 30 years old, so we need to remake all these puppets." <laughs> Yeah. And so you had you had three weeks to remake the entire cast of Rapunzel, and so you fi- you figured it out, and you you know t- take them apart, and then realize oh you shouldn't have taken that apart and put it back together and and figure it out. But it was a great kind of on the ground training for that style of theater. And there's things I love rod puppetry because they're they're good actors. There's a lot of good storytelling you can do. Rod puppets are grounded in a way that I find super satisfying, and they're, they have very direct control compared to like a marionette or something. So I. I I love that style. I still go back to that style whenever I can. For, I think, Haley and Kathy and maybe Chris, well, and Tao too, you guys were kind of inspired by the Muppet style. Is that true? I mean, Haley, when you were in Disney, was that the style that they were going toward? Yes. In Disney, the two shows that I worked on were Voyage of the Little Mermaid. I played Flounder and Playhouse Disney Live on Stage, where we played a whole cast of different Hand and Rod characters. And, uh, and just to plug those puppeteers down there real quick, like that, I, uh, those guys and ladies are just some of the, some of the most talented puppeteers in the world because they work so hard, but also it's such a great training ground because, you know, you've got your hand up in the air with these heavy puppets that are built, built to last 10 years. That's mm. the idea. And so there are these stiff, heavy puppets and you're doing six shows a day you know, just lip syncing to, to tracks. And so it just, it just trains your hands so well. But yeah, it was, it was mostly that style. There were some other puppetry shows on property, but I only did those two. And Chris, when you came into puppetry at that uh, puppet company, was that Muppet style? Uh, most of it was Hannah Rod. We honestly did a lot of suit puppetry, which I was always dreamed about. So we have these quick changes backstage to get the pants on and get the whole thing <laughs> and the whole suit on and like, here I go, baby. Um, and did the mouths move? Did they articulate? Yeah, the mouths, the mouths moved and everything. Uh, one of their claims to fame where they were like, we're the, we're the biggest puppet company in the Midwest. But no, like just because the puppets are literally really big. <laughs> Because <laughs> there's only like eight people in the company. Yeah. And then we just had these enormous, like seven feet, eight feet tall puppets that we would, very like, uh, what's it, bread and puppet uh, theater. Yeah. Kind of like the big, like just like storming through an elementary gym. But um, I love the rod puppet stuff, hand the rod stuff. But the suit stuff was always great because whenever you came out backstage, you get, ooh, <laughs> some nice. kids would just start crying. Yeah. And Tao, I know that you're inspired so much by Sesame and by everything that Jim Henson did. Did you ever try any other kinds of styles of puppetry other than the Muppet style? Yeah. I mean, growing up, it was less of that. I didn't start really delving into it until... I guess somewhere after high school, but when I was six or seven, my, you know, my, my parents tried to put us into, you know, different things to get us into different, uh, interests. Uh, so we first tried martial arts and it, it was, it was fine. You know, I, I had a fine time, but I found myself like performing in martial arts. Like I was being kind of <laughs> like the goofy guy. And so, <laughs> and so my, my parents were like, okay, well, maybe we should put Tao in theater. So they put me in a, in a theater company called the Rose Theater. I was living in Nebraska at the time. So that's where that is. And, you know, so we did a couple performances and stuff. And that's where I like learned how to, or started to learn to act and things like that. And I also, um, they, they did some puppetry stuff too, like how to make simple puppets out of all kinds of materials and they, they taught us different kinds of puppetry it wasn't just the muppet style mouth moving puppets it was you know shadow puppets and uh, rod puppets and all kinds of things and um i did that i also went to the o'neill when i was 17 uh, and that's where i started to really like get into that into other forms of puppetry i didn't realize how interested i was in other forms of puppetry until i did the o'neill i guess it, you know it taught me a lot about how how the human body work and how that translates to you know puppetry and how it translates to this you know every everything kind of connects through that cool that <laughs> kathy I'll, I'll ask you was there anything in particular about the style of puppetry when you first got into it because you said you came into it late you were just doing monitor puppetry 
Henson style puppetry. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, it started out, you know, it was like the hand and rod style, classic Muppet style um, for stage. Cause um, we did end up forming a, an improv troupe uh, that performed pretty briefly. Um, but then he sort of moved on and said, if anybody else wants to take it to the next level and learn monitor, then I, you know, I can offer a class there. And so, yeah, I jumped from there straight into Sesame street somehow. Um, <laughs> Imagine my luck. But, you know, I did get to work on Helpsters um, last year where there was a little bit of tabletop, you know, in front of a green screen. And so I got to assist on that. And I really love it. I'd love to do it more. But yeah, no, I I would love to learn other styles of puppetry. I just haven't been able to yet. I got to jump in and say that Kathy was a ninja on Helpsters. (laughs) Her, Her main job was to stand behind Heart and assist Heart. And we would have cameras moving all just on a jib moving around and you would never see Kathy. She, she, <laughs> that's not true. If you watch the first her. couple episodes, <laughs> you will see, you see a little bit of me. Uh, but I had the weirdest job on helpsters. I don't know if it's okay to jump into this. Yeah, please. I had the strangest job on helpsters. Um, heart was the big walk around character and, um, they, Ingrid Hansen, the performer, would have her right hand in the mouth, her left hand in the arm, and then they would cut, they cut like a, a seam, like the back of the arm seam, where I would shove my right arm in, and then because heart sort of like tapered down, I would have to slant my body and like figure out what the skinniest angle of my body was in relation to the camera and figure out a way in with a moving camera, sometimes walk with her, sometimes dance with her and just be constantly just shifting my body in a slanted squat. And that's how I spent the summer of 2019. (laughs) It was a blast. (laughs) Very cool. And Megan, you, you started with church puppetry, but then you started doing ventriloquism. Yeah, it it sort of happened. So I started off doing puppetry and I was learning ventriloquism on my own. Our puppetry team, we would get together probably about once a week to practice for children's church um, where we would perform. That was our only gig. (laughs) (laughs) And it was all stage puppetry behind the curtains. We didn't use monitors or anything. So it was really just looking up and eyeballing the puppet, which was pretty fun. And on the side, I was learning ventriloquism. And so um, in breaks between our different songs as a team, I would do a little ventriloquism sketch and then go back behind the curtain curtain and this was when we were about maybe 10 to 13 years old we went back to that same conference where we learned um to perform and compete but by the time every got to everyone got to high school they became too cool for puppets and i was like where are you guys going <laughs> and i was the only one left so i was like well looks like i'm gonna be doing ventriloquism i'll just talk to myself <laughs> but no i really did love it so i um continued to do ventriloquism at my church and then other churches and schools and you know all this talk about different styles of puppetry I almost forgot that I I used I dabbled in other styles of puppetry I really loved marionettes um I never incorporated incorporated them into my performance but I loved figuring out how to make an object move like a human so I would I would make marionettes out of clay and and cloth in my free time and that was just kind of a a small aspiration of mine of being able to master building a marionette and getting to move the different different joints and body parts but um, those are really the main styles of puppetry that I I dabbled in, marionettes, um, stage puppetry, and ventriloquism, and monitors was a, a complete new beast for me a few months ago. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're kind of, you're our newest mentee, yeah. and monitor work is a new thing for you. So if you guys, your other mentees, can picture yourself back when you were just learning how to do the monitor. Can you give Megan any helpful hints or any words of encouragement? Yes, encouragement. (laughs) Austin. Yeah, first off, it gets better. (laughs) The more you do it, uh, the more you do it, the better and better and better you're going to get. One that I think uh, Paul McGinnis taught me, familiar to some of us. Uh, (laughs) That's my husband. That's your husband. (laughs) Uh, Focus really, really, really uh, on your centering. If you're doing like a centering exercise, being really, really in the middle of the frame, uh, not only using the logo that you have, like if it's Samsung or whatever make of TV or monitor it is, uh, but focus on dividing the screen in half based on uh, the center where the puppet is to one side of the monitor or the other. And you can kind of keep 
tracking where exactly center is. If you're going right to camera, focus on one side of the monitor and kind of keep that space even. Spencer. Megan, I found, and it's continued, that, I, that my growth on monitor goes in steps. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit a, a new skill, you know, like, like looking straight to lens. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. Like, okay, great. There's Got one it. thing, Try but it. then yeah. it'll plateau. It'll, it'll plateau for a while while I'm building up other skills and then mm-hmm. no, I'll, I'll kind of level up. And so yeah. I've, it's, it's definitely a curve. And I, I found my eye is much more refined than my skill. Still, I can identify mm-hmm. the tenets yeah. of good puppetry and identify right. what, what I should be aiming for, but st- still just knowing that even a, you know a decade plus you know 14 years into it i'm still refining and refining and mm-hmm. and, and working on my consistency in in stair steps it's not a clean thing that i that i got to learn overnight I, that's that's not the, what happened for me yeah kathy one of the things that marty robinson taught us at the workshop is that it's not necessarily that you get to a point where you're perfect every time you just keep improving until you get quicker and quicker at catching and correcting mix mistakes. And that I, that advice I've taken with me since that first workshop. Yeah, Tom. I will say, yeah, there's one thing that I think helps, especially for you, because you're so musically inclined. I think lip syncing to songs like on, on the monitor, that is something that has at least helped me a lot um, when learning it, because then you're, you're learning to something that is very specific, like the, the, the sound of a song. It teaches you to hear what you're supposed to feel and see if that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. really good, Tao. It also takes away that necessity of having to, I have to also create a voice and a character <laughs> yeah. and say something that's going to, you don't have to do that because it's a song. And if you know right. the words, you can just kind of focus in and hone in on that. Chris, right. did you have something? Right. Yeah, my thing is, which is like, it's just like, it's new agey, is the fact that we all have now cameras in our pockets all the time, mm-hmm. which has really changed. For, for me, I have to have... Um, whatever I'm working on, readily available so that at any point in time, I can just move right into it. I don't even, when I'm practicing my sax, I don't even put it back in the case because I know that I put it in the case, it's extra yeah. effort for me to get through. I'm like, yeah. So the idea of having the apps that will flip the image uh, mm-hmm. on iPhone or whatever you use and so you can really just play around with getting used to it mm-hmm. really helps and having it so quickly available you <laughs> yeah. so your brain can jump on it. Yeah. But we're going to take a break from our interview with the Sesame Street mentees because it's time for a word from our sponsor. Oh no, I've dropped my carton of eggs. No, you didn't. Oh. Abigail, ever since I met you in that coffee shop, I knew you were the one for me. I'm not Abigail, you're my brother. What's a coffee shop? Oh. Does this sound all too familiar? Are your scenes over before they've even begun? Do you feel like just as your scene partner passes you the ball, you drop it in the mud? Well, you need Yes And. Yes And is a simple two-word solution to get your gears turning and your brain working. Simply begin your character's reply with Yes And to see your scene troubles melt away. I used to be a real scene killer. But ever since I started using Yes And, my scenes are the ones doing the killing. Happy birthday, Samantha. Would you like to blow out your birthday candles? Yes, and here I go. (laughs) My scenes used to really stink. Here, hold this radioactive baby. No. But ever since Yes And... Here, hold this radioactive baby. Yes And, I will raise her as my own. (laughs) Thanks, Yes And. Yes And, you're welcome. Yes And is not an appropriate solution for every improv situation. Those who use Yes And may suffer from an uncontrollable urge to invite friends to their improv shows. Yes And is not responsible for scenes that result in long-form improv, Robert De Niro impressions, or scenes involving transactions and fast food joints. Please use Yes And responsibly. That's right. Today's episode of Below the Frame is brought to you by Yes And. Now, Yes And is... Oh, boy. Yes, Jack. How'd you know it was me? Oh, because you're the only one that interrupts me while I'm doing my podcast. Maybe. What are you talking about today? (laughs) Well, we are talking about improvisation in puppetry. And actually, to speak a little bit more about improvisation in puppetry, here is Muppet performer Tyler Bunch. Greetings, salutations. Tyler Bunch here talking to you about improv. Improv, you say? Well, I know all about improv. Or, improv? Improv makes me nervous. 
I'm a little scared of it. Or, improv? Yeah, that doesn't really ever have anything to do with what I do. You're all wrong! <laughs> improv can be intimidating. Uh, anyone who's done it knows that you can never, ever stop learning more. And it touches every part of a performer's life. Why? Well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, learning to uh, access your improv muscles makes you better at pretty much every aspect of communicating ideas to another person. And ultimately, that's what we do and why we do what we do. Uh, it helps you to be more playful. It helps you to literally find the game in things and make those things more fun for you and therefore more fun for the audience. It allows you to take direction more freely because you're learning to listen and incorporate thoughts into the things that you're trying to do. It allows you to be reactive and in the moment because of that said same listening. You have to hear what's coming in order to respond. Acting is reacting. Puppeteers are actors. You have to literally listen to what's coming before in order to know how your character needs to say the next line or be involved in the next moment. It also gives you more confidence in your own ideas because I promise the more that you do it with in front of other people, the more you begin to realize your ideas are valid, they contribute, and you're better at this than you think, or it helps you realize how you can get even better. Um, so, in, you know, in that vein, it gives you confidence um, and makes it easier for an audience to kind of climb into whatever character it is you're trying to present to them. So you notice I haven't said anything about being funny in any of this. A lot of people, when they hear that word, they think, oh, improv, I need to be funny. Well, yes, it does improve uh, your ability to make humorous moments happen in front of an audience, but not through the effort of being funny, through the effort of being specific. The specificity of a character and their approach to something can be informed by your ideas, your specific take on things, the information set in your head that allows you to paint those interesting colors, put those interesting facets on the way a character communicates something. And you do that by more readily accessing that information set that is uniquely you. You are never more interesting to an audience than when you surprise them. The characters that we like to watch, we kind of know what they're going to do or their attitude. We sit and wait to watch how it's going to happen. How are they going to bring their unique uh, take on the world to this moment? And the way you help mold and create those unique aspects of the character is by simply mining the unique things that are about you. There's a game that I play when I'm um, helping young folks or uh, inexperienced or anybody who wants to come in and, and play around and, and uh, do an improv gym where we do the old one word suggestion thing. And I basically ask everyone to think of a unique story about their personal experience and think of another word that has to do with that specific experience. Like everyone's done word association where they like, you know, red and ball or whatever, where you, you come up with the first word that comes to your brain. Well, instead you come up with a word that's unique to your take on red, some emotionally connected thing to that color. And everyone in the room comes up with something unique because it's personal and nothing is more interesting than something that isn't me. <laughs> As an audience member, I want to be surprised. And to hear that you've got a different take or to hear that you have a different experience with the subject matter than I do is engaging. And more often than not, when you're entertained or you, you laugh at something, it's because you were surprised by it. And everything I've just said how do you surprise someone? Well, you come up with an association that they never would have thought of and you figure out a way to justify it and make it real to them and as important to them as it is to you or to your character. And that's basically 
what performing storytelling is. Someone's unique experience being translated for an audience in a way that they can absorb and identify with. That's improv. The unique things about you brought into the moment by listening and reacting. So take an improv class. Learn how to listen. React with everything that is uniquely you. And keep those muscles in shape and keep that fluidity of information flowing and it will improve every aspect of your artistic self. Thank you, Tyler. So you see, Jack, improvisation is... Well, that's my time. Thanks oh. for having me, Dad. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jack. What? What? Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, I'd like to thank Yes And for being a sponsor of Below the Frame. Go, go, go. We are back with the Sesame Street mentees. So uh, we're going to talk about the workshops now. And so I said in the intro that on Sesame Street, I'm the puppet captain and Martin P. Robinson is the assistant puppet captain and it's our job to hold workshops. And so most years we try to hold one, if not two puppeteer workshops at Sesame. And sometimes we ask people to send in videos to kind of apply to come to the workshop. And sometimes we ask people that we've seen before at another workshop. And then it's still other times we do a blind ask of somebody where we may not have met that person, but we've heard from somebody else about them. We do it in all sorts of ways. And then we run different kinds of workshops with different focuses. So we might do a beginner workshop, and that's usually when we ask people to send in their videos to us, and then we kind of pick out from there. I mean, we've had, we've had 300 submissions that Marty and I have gone through to try to get it down to a manageable number. We could do a, a character workshop where we focus on creating and building characters. And that's usually for more advanced people that we know about and who've been to a workshop before. We focused on diversity and bringing in people of, of diverse backgrounds to do a workshop and, and done that. And we've even done, and this might be my favorite, is a three camera workshop where it's really for our most advanced performers and it's a lot of fun, but it's really very challenging. And most of you have been to at least one Sesame Puppeteer workshop. Can you tell us your impression of, of your time at a workshop? What do you get there? Haley? Yeah. So I did the workshop in 2014 and then I did one of those three camera workshops. Yeah. And our, yeah. our workshop in 2014 was the first workshop that I was, I think, puppet captain for. Yeah. And I remember before I went in, I had heard from a lot of people that because they, these workshops have pa happened in the past and they've been um, a little bit scary <laughs> because it ends up feeling like a competition or an audition. And so I was a little nervous. I was like, oh, I, I, I just don't know what the environment's going to be. And then you get in there and I got to say all of that kind of went away because it, even though a workshop, technically, you know, everyone's kind of, in a way it's like an audition. It's an unofficial audition where you, you just get to be seen by people that could potentially, you know, bring you back. But the workshop itself was just a giant room of a ton of, you know, fellow puppeteers. And we are all at varying stages of whatever skill. And it's awesome because we all get paired together and it ended up being a super supportive environment that um, you learn right off the bat. Like, okay, if you look at this like an audition or like a, a competition, you're going to have a miserable time. And, and who wants that? <laughs> Just kind of felt like a three day fun let's all throw some, some Sesame puppets on and, and mess around with each other and learn a few things. And it's also a great opportunity if you're a puppeteer. Most puppeteers are working in a vacuum. They don't, they've not met other puppeteers. And it's really a great opportunity for you to meet other like-minded performers and network in that way. Boston? It's really probably their first time in a professional monitor setup setting. You know, that's not just going to be, oh, it's my, my FaceTime camera or it's my, my dad's camcorder or something. It's going to be, okay, no, these are like studio cameras and lighting and you got the right background. You got puppets that work really beautifully, you know, made by the Henson company. Uh, this might be your first time seeing how this really works and kind of jumpstart you even further. Like when I did the first workshop, first thing I said when I went home, okay, now I've got to build a puppet that's way up to snuff that can perform much better uh, as a tool, but something that's like a really muppety feeling that can do just what they do. And I think having the right tools for that, your camera, your puppet, uh, your lighting, whatever, what have you, um, are going to help jumpstart that. And I think yeah. these workshop settings are 
pushing us to be even better in a different way than just performing to, you know, being able to recognize what looks better. Go ahead, Kathy. Like it's such a learning um, experience that did anybody else feel uh, simultaneously better and also worse at the end of each day? (laughs) You learn so much and you grow so much, but then you're like, Oh, and then you're just like running over all the mistakes and like, you know, comparing yourself to everybody else. Like I left every day feeling like invigorated and also just like, Oh gosh, I have so much more work to do. (laughs) That's intentional. Uh, no, (laughs) it's not, but it's inevitable. I mean, I think if you're really putting your heart into it and we do, we lump a bunch of stuff on you right away. And then we just keep on adding to it, adding to it. And, and the hope is that some of it will stick We know that not everything is going to stick, but hope some of it does. And so that then you'll be able to become critical of your own work and then be able to add to it and and improve. Spencer? Well, I was just going to say one thing that helped me, helped frame it in my mind, um, especially having gone to the workshop in 2006 and then coming back to a workshop in 2014 was the idea that there are, there are actually no jobs. This is not an audition. <laughs> there are no jobs. <laughs> so so that is, that's just so important. And so I've been able to, to, to change my frame of reference to think, oh, this is a diagnostic for me as an actor, as a performer. This, first of all, it, we can pat ourselves in the back and be like, holy crap, we are in the room. We are in the room where our, our mentors and our heroes are passing on this information to us. And, and whatever sticks, you know, is, is, is great, but we're, we're doing something right to be in this room, which is exciting. And then, and then to see, to, to use it uh, almost as a callback or as if you, if you like to be competitive or not, or as a diagnostic to say, oh, okay, I am actually doing this very well. I've been working on this skill set, but you know what? This other side of me is I'm not, I need to cultivate these skills. So next time this comes around, I'm going to be a more well-rounded performer. So I, I love it as a, as a chance to check in with my practice and with my art and see, okay, this is where I stack up and this is how I can keep growing. Tao. Uh, I, I agree. In fact, I, um, the first workshop I went to in 2016, where I met quite a few of you, I met Spencer there, I met Kathy there. I think Haley, you might've been there. I don't know, but, um, Maybe not. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> I um, I saw you know my going in. I was I was 16, and I thought, oh well, I'm probably the youngest guy there, which means I'm probably very good, which means like I don't have a lot to learn. And then I went in, and then I was immediately humbled. <laughs> and um, you know, like I the a good thing about those workshops is that it really it's they're honest. You know, Matt, Marty, and Peter are, are very honest about what it is that you need to work on and also the things that you are good at, but like, you know, they give you, they give you specifics and they, they give you a chance to, uh, to try things and fail at things and just keep trying. And one of the best parts about it is that it's collaborative. You, you, you're paired with people and you, you have a chance to work with a partner and, um, that's something you don't get from working at home at home. You're often doing things by yourself and just trying stuff, technical stuff alone. But then when you're with someone else, it's often, you end up coming up with characters, whether it's intentional or not. It, it makes you better at um, acting and relating to someone else. It is all in the idea that we want you to recognize in yourself, what do I need to work on? Where do I need to improve? So it's something a little bit what Spencer was saying, and then, and then you too, Tao, that, that we try to point those things out to you. You know, you, For me, one of the things that I'm really particular about is having a bold character and how to create those bold characters, especially if it's like we're doing this one page thing where it's 30 seconds. How are you going to get across a bold character in 30 seconds? And and just kind of letting yourself, allowing yourself to to be vulnerable enough to just put something out there and it may succeed or it may suck and it's okay either way, you know? And, And another important thing I think for me that I'm looking for at these workshops is I'm looking for good people, nice people, people that work well together. Nobody wants to work with an asshole. You know, we, we want to be, we want to work with nice people and we want to be around nice people. So that's an important, an important part of this as well. Is there something, any particular something that we did at a workshop any one of them that you may have been to that sticks with you. Haley. Yeah. Um, it's actually just a thing that Marty said in one of, uh, uh, you know, at, at the workshops, uh, you, Marty and Peter all split off and we would, you know, as a group kind of move around and do your own individual 
like many, many workshops <laughs> that in Marty's, he said that you should always think of your character as a capped volcano. And that's always really stuck with me. He said, whatever emotion your character has, whether it's fear, excitement, sadness, whatever, think of it as being so full of that emotion that it's like a volcano with a cap on it, that if you were to just let the cap off, you would just blow up with that emotion. But if you keep it right under the surface, whatever it is, it's going to be such an engaging character. And then if you look at Telly Monster, he said, he was like, you know, Telly is always, he always has to be holding on to something because if he let go, he would fall off the edge of the earth. (laughs) (laughs) And that's, yeah. And I just, I've always, that whole capped volcano thing has just stuck with me. Austin. One other Marty thing I remember. I remember being in one of the studios and hearing him bellow from the next room. There's no crying in puppetry. <laughs> <laughs> Just always hear him. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but, uh, but with him, a serious thing about him, he does a great, great exercise that I don't know if it originated with him, but I've, I've learned it from him uh, about choreography. Um, and it's, uh, it's in a few different beats. You go right, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, up, up, down, down, forward, forward, back, back. I think that's it. And it's something like that. And everybody's kind of standing, uh, looking at the yeah. monitor together, right. got a ton of, right, following a ton of him. Correct. Air. Right. And his rule is we all get it right three times in a row where we don't stop. And that's a great, great way to practice at home too. Chris, did you have something? Uh, so I'm on the Marty train too. Sorry. Yeah, man. Um, well, you know, he's, he's got such experience and he's trained uh, hundreds of people, if not thousands of people all over the world. He's got, so, but I remember him saying specifically, and I swear it's on a, sticky note somewhere in this room uh <laughs> he said um uh, being safe is never going to serve us and i think about that a lot i'm like dang he's right and uh when i think about the things we do at the workshop we usually sometimes if we're lucky we'll end it with uh lip sync which is just like <laughs> you know lip sync in your brain you're going oh, come on baby one more exercise don't <laughs> screw this up but really you should be like this is the last thing let's go out and have fun and so it's just balancing that thing and then realizing like, man, I just need to go all out and see where my ceiling is. And that's a lot of the issues I have, even as a fleshy actor, seeing where my ceiling is, what I can do. Yeah. And I think a lot of the things that Marty says, he's not just talking about puppetry. He kind of lives by that philosophy of, you know, not, not being safe. He also does this exercise that I love that is, um, and Tao, maybe you know this one, it's, can you go any bigger? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Tao, can you tell us about that exercise? What is Yeah, this is something that's very useful. Uh, Again, not just with puppetry, but fleshy acting as well. Any kind of acting. It's, you know, how far can you go with what it is that you're trying to convey? And I have this problem, I think, excuse me, I think um, (laughs) just, you know, in general, like I'm very subdued. You know, I, I, uh, I keep things to myself quite a bit. And the drill is to just whatever the phrase is that you're saying or whatever it is that you that you are saying or doing how big can you do it and you they keep they keep saying do it again do it again see how how much more you can you know yeah and I, th- I think marty is like until you're bleeding from uh-huh. your mouth <laughs> until you've <laughs> you're spitting up everything. blood <laughs> yeah <laughs> how big yeah. can you go and people are just screaming at the top of well you know they're they are thinking they are doing they're hitting the top they're doing as big as they can and they're finished with it and marty will just kind of lean over and say can you go any bigger yeah. and inevitably the person goes yeah I think I can. And then they try it again and then they, you know, try to blow it out of the water. But it is trying to see like what, how, how far can you push it? How, how, how big can you go? Yeah. And it's something else, something else that Marty, Marty said to me once that like, uh, we were doing one of those choreography exercises and I, it was the first workshop. So I was very confident and I, um, (laughs) I was, you know, trying to show like, Oh, I could, I could do this. I'm, I could do this in my sleep. And so, you know, I was adding little, little things to it and kind of like making the puppet laugh and things like that. And Marty, his puppet turns to my puppet and says, uh, no playing right now. We're going to, we're doing the exercise you play later. And I mean, that's, that's very, Good. That's a good thing to say because it's like, yeah, you get, you do the rudimentary stuff. You do what's important right now. You have dessert later. 
You know, you know, people come into these workshops sometimes, and some of them are very, are very accomplished puppeteers, or they've done a lot of work on their own, and they do their own thing. And we come in and we just say, look, we want you just to enter the frame, stop center, look at camera, say your name, say, I came from over there, now I'm going over there, and exit. But do it neutral. Don't add anything to it. Just don't even add a character voice. Just do it as yourself. We need to see everybody's baseline, especially at those, those initial puppetry workshops where we've you know asked people to send in their videos and we've made a quick judgment on a one minute of them putting themselves in, on on tape and um, by the end of the week we're hoping that everybody has at least they know what they need to do to improve they've hopefully seen improvement in their own puppetry they've maybe made a few friends that they can keep in touch with later and say hey you want to get together on on Thursday and do a monitor night or something um, I mean that's kind of the the goal of that let's say that there's somebody out there who wants to come to a puppet workshop with us what would you think is important for them to know coming in to this workshop. Kathy. I think getting in your head that it is not an audition is really important because first of all, it says it very clearly in the email that you will receive. But secondly, no one is expecting anybody who's coming into this workshop to be at the level that you guys are as like cast Muppeteers. And it's impossible to expect that. What you're being brought in to do you're being brought on for your potential. And so uh, more than, or just as important as like your technical skills or how funny you are is how well you can listen, how well you can take a note, how well you can seamlessly click into a team or a group. And so to not be fully present and, you know, really soak in this once in a lifetime opportunity to learn from masters is just, it's, it's, it's a waste, you know, like you can't come in nervous as if it's an audition and you can't come in guns a-blazing like it's the Gary show. I'm talking to somebody named Gary. I don't know. <laughs> you can't come in guns a-blazing you're right. like it's an audition no, But either. you're right, because there are people that have come in that have been like, you know, they're very confident and they, we can, we can mm. tell, you know. It's and, a missed opportunity it is. to be yeah. fully present. Yep. And then they, they want to see who you are. You're not going to, you're not going to be that level. Like they're not going to hire you on the spot. You, nobody is that good coming into the workshop. It's impossible. But, you know, to be fully present, to be yourself and nobody else yeah. and have fun is the best piece of advice I can give to somebody going into a workshop. Yeah, that's really nice, Kathy. Anybody else? Haley. Yeah, I, oh my gosh, Kathy totally nailed it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not an audition for sure. But also just, there are going to be moments in the workshop where you're going to be like, oh, crap. <laughs> like I did, I did that so wrong. But in, in the 2014 workshop, Spencer, I specifically remember a moment with you because I didn't know you that well back then. And we weren't in the same group going around um, to the different like little pods but when at the end of the day, you know, everyone's in one big room together, everyone's going up and doing these different exercises and the whole room gets to watch it. And I see this guy, Spencer Lott, who's a really great puppeteer, like you're nailing it and you're doing this scene and then something technically you, you did it wrong and you just went, Gah! just like screamed as yourself, but you were laughing so hard at, at whatever you effed up that... It just brought me so much joy and it brought everyone so much joy because just having that attitude of being like, of course I'm going to mess up. Of course, yeah. this is a workshop. I'm going to mess up. And when it happens, it might be so weird that it's hilarious. <laughs> like, I just, <laughs> That's true. I would just always encourage people going in just to laugh at yourself like that because it puts everyone else at ease and it just shows your confidence too. And don't be afraid to fail. That's, yeah. That is why you're there. You're there to mess up so that we can try to give you tips on how to maybe fix it. Okay, so one of the goals of our mentorship program is to deepen the bench of performers on Sesame Street. And this group, except for Megan because she's the newest member, but this group has actually gotten to be on set and observe how we shoot the show. And so we have a room set up for them at Kaufman where we shoot Sesame Street and it has a camera and a monitor and uh, we'll do lunchtime workshops and we'll bring in one of the Muppet performers to come in and talk about uh, arm rods or talk about assisting or talk about their experience with Jim Henson. We have a bunch of different people come in and then we leave that camera and the monitor on all day so that the mentees can go in and work on skills 
when they're able to. And uh, the mentees have actually gotten to work on Sesame Street with a puppet on their hand or more likely assisting a, a principal performer. So I want you to, you guys, if you can remember, what was your first day working as a performer on Sesame Street? Who's got something? Austin. My first day at Sesame, I was still a student at UConn and I got an email. Hey, we wanted to come work Sesame for a day. And I think my vision is turned off. I think everything just went black in the world from excitement. And it was for a show where they're baking a cake and they're trying to keep it from the cookie monster. So they lock down Hooper's store, but they don't realize they lock him in there. And they're trying to, <laughs> and all the Muppets and, and Chris uh, are trying to get back in by solving puzzles. And big, uh, uh, Grover runs the Bagels and Locks Locksmith Company. And I assisted Marty with an octopus. And when you work with Marty, he's a real stinker. He's a fan of the friendly hazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so what we were, we were on rollies, you know, little butt scooters. We were back to back and it was three, two, one, go. And he took off on the rollie like a rocket, <laughs> like a rocket. He did it to me again this season. He actually knocked my shoes off. Uh, but at that time, uh, very first take, very first shot on Sesame Street. He went off like a rocket. I dropped the rods. I fell backwards off the rolly. I yelled, ah, crap. And I'm still here. Uh, which I didn't think I was in the middle of the take, moment. you yelled at no, in, in the middle, middle of the take. Ah, crap. And I'm backwards. <laughs> Um, sorry guys. Sorry. Who is this? It just fell. That was my first day at Sesame street. Cool. But I, I lived, so it gets better. That's the theme. I think it gets better. Well, um, my first day into the deep, man, I was assisting Abby with best friend band doing the guitar solos. And I was like, I remember the time my mom was like, they had me doing that. She's like, the first day. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Cause this it is weird. Cause I, I mean, I'm sure that all the, newer Sesame Street puppeteers have imposter syndrome up to like 10. So you walk on a set and you're like, I'm supposed to be here. And then you, they're just sitting down. You're like, well, you're doing this thing. I'm like, really? Are you? And then just, you're just doing it. And it's, it was all day. And I was for sure that after lunch, they'd be like, we, we made a mistake. Why are you doing that? But after lunch, we just picked it up and kept going. I was like, Oh my God. And it was just into the deep end. Kathy. My first date was, it feels surreal. You're looking at the set that you grew up with. I'm under a table. I was assisting Abby. Had no idea that Abby's wand is in her right hand. That was a fun, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a nice discovery. Oh my goodness. It, but I'm like under the table with, you know, there's Big Bird, Grover's behind me, Elmo, Abby. And I'm like, what is my life right now? <laughs> And I remember Peter Lintz, he, you know, gave me this sort of unofficial tour and he even found like a tiny little big bird feather. Um, this is season 46. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose it. So I ran back to the green room and put this little big bird, tiny feather in my wallet. And Carol was there. And he said, what are you, I'm like, I um, didn't want to lose it. I, and then he's like, oh, that's a small one. You should get a full size feather. I'm like, I, okay. And like, I ran away. <laughs> But then later that day, between takes, I feel a tap on my shoulder and it's Carol and he's bending over to give me a full size feather. I'm going to cry talking about it. Uh. And it, I felt like, not that I watched The Bachelor, but you know, when they give you like the last rose, I'm like, oh my God. And I was like, thank you so much. And he said, it's a special one too, because he, it has silk backing. So it doesn't, I'm like, stop talking. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, terrified, survived Abby's wand, surreal. Carol, Feather, Magical. Who else? Town. So my first day was season 48. And um, I remember the day that you told me I was going to be on that season, Matt. Uh, it was the second day of my uh, workshop. And the very end of the day, I'm about to leave. And you're like, hey, Tao, um, yeah, we're going to have you on this season. And I didn't say anything. I just went, uh, uh. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and um, so, I, you know, taken aback. Uh, and I, you know, I was very excited. So the day comes and I'm 16. So they think that I'm a kid, like, Oh, I am a kid. Um, so they don't take me to the Muppet room. They take me to the kid green room. That's and, right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I didn't know any better. I was like, Oh, I guess that's where I'm supposed to go. I'm, I'm a kid. And so I'm there for like <laughs> 15 minutes and uh, I got there early, but you know, <laughs> eight, eight 15 comes. And they're like, oh, where's uh, where's Tao? And I think I think it was Marty that called. He he calls up and and she's like, oh, 
oh, I'm sorry. And then, <laughs> so I'm walking back to the Muppet Room and everybody's there. Pam's there, Marty's there. It's actually a, a full cast that day. All the Muppets are in. And uh, so everybody's in the room and they're like, oh, Tal, he's finally here. He made it to the Muppet Room. And, um, and I'm assisting uh, Rosita's abuela that day. And that was played by Jen, Jennifer Barnhart, who's left-handed. So her left hand is in the, the head and her right hand's in the, in the hand. So my left hand is to be the character's left hand, which I was not prepared for because, you know, usually it's right-handing. And um, it's not that different. In fact, it's, it's quite easy. Well, not easy, but it's easier than, you know, doing the, the main character. Um, but still, you know, because it's, you know, the monitor stuff and, uh, <laughs> and I'm not left-handed, it was, it was very, it was a bit of a jarring experience, but I got through it and it was a lot of fun. And um, constantly getting, uh, you know, teased for being a kid. <laughs> Haley. My, so my first day, well, my first day ever assisting a Sesame character, I was actually assisting you, Matt, I, on the Katie Couric talk show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were doing the count for a Halloween episode, and I was your right hand. And as soon as we popped up behind, like, the little couch, we got rushed by, like, 20 children. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing and yeah. um, crazy. But my first day on the set... Uh, First thing I did was I walked, as soon as I walked into the set, I walked over to Big Bird's mailbox and looked in it because I always wanted to know. And there was some sheet music in there. It was very exciting. It was actually, there was stuff in the mailbox. Um, but I was playing a dog character. It was a, I don't remember the name of the episode, but there's a counting moment where there's like five dogs and each one like barks for like one, two, three, four, five. I think I was dog number four. And um, <laughs> in the scene, like we did like the, the, barking and then we were supposed to all run around and kind of like get excited and it's just sort of chaos and we did the shot and I'm running around with the dog and then we watch playback and in playback you can see the entire top half of not just my head but my face because you can see my face staring up at the dog and just smiling because I'm like oh my god it's happening it's happening <laughs> I just paid no attention to the monitor and of course, we had to do another take because it's just five dogs and my face <laughs> running around. <laughs> That's funny. It was very exciting. Spencer. Uh, so I was on the F train between fourth and ninth and Smith and ninth when I got an email that asked for my availability for a, a Sesame job and I lost my mind. And uh, it was not only was it a Sesame job, it was Sesame and SNL. <laughs> And it was like a co it was like a, it was like a skit. And I was like, Does, I should probably retire. This is <laughs> it's never gonna get better than this. And so I was Pam must have been busy or out of town or something. So cause I was right handing for Marty. We were on the roof of Sesame Workshop with Telly Monster with and Kate McKinnon shooting something for Mashable. Except it, it's a real skeleton crew. It's just like threw it together and it's it's so small that the only way to get audio for Kate McKinnon is a, a, a microphone that Telly Monster is holding. Oh. I'm a ho and so I'm here holding the microphone and then they're like, um, Spencer? And I'm like, oh, I'm fired. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm like, can you hold the microphone closer to Kate's mouth so we can record her audio? And I was like, this this microphone is plugged in. <laughs> this is an actual microphone. So if, if you watch it back, you'll just see like Kate and then just like this microphone just like hovering <laughs> around her face because I was so nervous. Um, and, then my, and then my first day on set was season 46 and I was assisting Johnny T. And it was a, it was a live hand. It was a small puppet version of Bruno live hands taking out some trash so we had to rip some cardboard um and you know slough it off and do like some fun assisty stuff and it was you know it's it's the moment that you all described it's just surreal and magical and terrifying in in all the best ways um so so yeah has uh, anything ever really gone wrong for anybody on sesame street on set that you care to share failure is a is a big part of learning so it's it's you know don't fear failing Chris, what do you have? Oh my God. Okay. So this two parter, um, <laughs> <laughs> the second part involves Spencer. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's the Christmas special and there's a movement. The camera jibs along all the characters are running, uh, the see Santa pull in all the characters. And so I ended up with both of the two head monsters on 
Barbara puts a chess monitor on me. I'm like, chess monitor? And we go a couple of takes. So I'm like, oh my God. And I'm trying to move and not trip Big Bird, who's right behind me at the same time. And then we did it like three or four times and it was not working. And then we re, re, re display. Look, let's do it this way. So Ernie's going to go here. Everyone's going here. Uh, uh, two head. Wait over there for us. I was like, oh. And so I, they had to rework the shot. It was impossible to get it. And so I was moping for like, I was like, ah, screw this shot up for about, for about like 10 seconds. And then we took a break. And I look over and Spencer is just like looking around Sesame. He's like, this is amazing. We get to be here. And was, I just started laughing. And then he was absolutely right. It was like, he was like, can you believe it? And he's like, skip, skip us off. And I'm like, what is happening? Uh, so that was my one of, I'm sure, many screw ups that the editors have had to cover. <laughs> Kathy. First of all, I want to tack on a bookend to my first day story was that I was pregnant and the carol feather is in my daughter's room frame. Ah, I love that. I love that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think it's safe to say, speak for all of us, we make the tiniest mistakes because it's not like in general we get given like huge things to do, but we will really pour over like, oh, that butterfly went dead for two seconds. I mean, amongst us, we're always like, ah, like overthinking everything. And that never never, stops. That never, ever, ever stops. That's what I hear. That's reassuring and scary at the same time. Uh, But what actually one time we had to redo uh, a take while you were in the bird because I dropped one of Elmo's hands and the look of like, (laughs) You have to do what because you what <laughs> like that you gave me as you walk back to your one. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. But the big one happened this last year um, where I was right handing for Cookie. David wasn't in. So oh, you, some of you guys were there because uh, I see your faces. <laughs> Peter was subbing in for Cookie and we had to enter frame. There was a bake sale happening with lots of cookies and, and things, lots of AMs buying cookies and then leaving. It was like a lot of stuff going on. Cookie leaves. Marty shoves a very slippery, large, heavy plastic jar in my hand full of money. The cookie then puts on the table and says, here's me money, give me cookies, right? So the thing about monitors is it's not just reverse, but there's not a lot of depth. And I'm like, there's a lot going on. I don't want to be the one to mess up this shot. And so I better be safe about the one, you know, like the very small real estate I have to put this jar of money down. We exit frame, Marty shoves the slippery jar in my hand. We enter back in the frame and I use my wrist to feel where the table is and I put the jar on the table and cut, right? Something else went wrong, but Peter's like, hey, when we do this again, I want you to slam that jar down definitively. I don't want you to just slide it. I'm like, okay, we do the take again. But I'm like, oh, it's slippery and I only have this much room to place it down. He's like, no, no, no. If we do it again, Kathy, slam it down definitively. Give me my cookies. I'm like, okay. Take three. We're getting really close to lunch break, so we got to get this in. Leave. Marty shoves a jar. Come back. Slam the jar on something not hard like a table, something soft and organic. It is Leslie Carrara's head. Oh, no. National treasure, (laughs) Leslie Carrara's head. And so then um, at cut, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. And they're like, what was that? And she's like, that was my head. I'm like, okay. So we go to lunch, we come back and to make it worse, they're like, okay, let's watch that last take and make sure that like, (laughs) should we get it again? So in front of the entire crew, we watch as a jar of money slams down kind of behind the table and you see Abby Kadabi unnaturally jerk up and scream. Oh man. I think we got to do that again. So Uh, can anyone top that? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Dow. I don't know. I don't know if it'll top this story. Okay. But it's definitely up there for pretty, pretty gruesome. I wasn't even working this day. I was 11 years old, and I've never told this story except maybe to. I told the story to John Cody, but no one else because it's so embarrassing. Well, don't worry. No one else will hear it except for us <laughs> right here. Is that that's not a fact, Matt? You're oh. wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess it's a safe space. I can tell the story now. When I was a kid practicing puppetry, my parents they would be very uh, quick to say, oh, that's not right. You got to do it like this because the thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess you know because well, you're my parent. I guess you know better, sure. So as a kid, I had that mindset that like, you know, if, if it doesn't work, that someone off camera will tell me. So 
when I'm 11 years old, Kevin Clash invites me to uh, observe one day. And he's doing, I think it might have been the first Elmo the Musical. And uh, Elmo is tap dancing on a whale. And um, it's, it's Kevin doing Elmo's head and John Tartaglia doing the, the arms and John Kennedy doing the feet. And multiple takes. <laughs> I see, like, I'm looking at the monitor, just like watching the whole thing. And I see, like, some, like, you know, Johnny K's head kind of pop up a little bit. In the middle of the take, I'm like, oh, hey, hey, John, your, your, your head's popping up there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Kevin, he's like, um, <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. But, and he's like, no, no, no we see it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> And so another take happens and you know, it happens again. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, your, your hands in the, in the shot there. <laughs> and, and Kevin goes, okay. Um, you want to like l- look around Hoopers. Let's see what's in Hoopers. <laughs> okay. And I was like, whatever. Sure. I'll look around Hoopers. Let's take a tour. Yeah, it, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> you were just trying to be helpful. I was, and I thought I was being helpful. <laughs> right. I was just prolonging the day though. <laughs> those are great those are great okay we are uh, going to come back with the mentees in a bit but first we are going to ask a puppeteer about not puppets ask the puppeteer about not puppets today we ask John Kennedy a question about not puppets okay John Kennedy did you have a favorite pet growing up we had a hamster named Hammy Doodle that was <laughs> <laughs> fun pet <laughs> But I always loved my first cat, Charlie the cat. It just showed up at our house, and we took it in, and Charlie, we'd tell Charlie, it's time to go, and Charlie would kind of wash up and get ready, and then we'd, we'd take really? him. Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Ask the puppeteer about not puppets. We are back with the Sesame Street mentees. Um, I mentioned observation. And uh, a little bit ago, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, we ask you guys to actually sit out on set when we're in production and watch us while, while we shoot. And that's how it used to be. Kind of informally, people would come in and they would observe and they would take in how we work, kind of like Tao did when he was 11. He came in to observe. But now it is a, an essential part of our program for the mentees just to kind of be there on set sitting on the floor, almost at our level or near us, somewhere near us so you can observe. What do you think is valuable about observing? And what have you observed specifically, things that you may have picked up that are helpful to know? Austin. I think that I don't want to use the phrase unsung heroes, but there are a lot, a lot, a lot of people that make every shot work. Uh, All of the, the core Muppet performers are absolute wizards in more than just character and voices and manipulation. Uh, there are times where I've watched Tyler Bunch, who I dearly love, uh, catch a catch a falling lamppost, specifically at the same point over and over again, maybe I think it was season 50, uh, where Peter Linz, who's amazing, not only as a performer and a teacher and an incredible kind human, uh, but he does incredible right-hand technical things and cowboy switches. And of course, there's John Kennedy, who I think is the absolute king of assisting. I think I feel like we're all going to nod in agreement that John yeah. Johnny K is the man who also taught an incredible uh, learning lunch, as you brought up, Matt, about assisting. So a lot, a lot, a lot of things that you pick up that you wouldn't know, like, oh, that had to be a person who's not just doing Elmo or Abby, which is also incredible and important and hard. Um, but there are a lot, a lot, a lot of things you catch just by sitting on the floor level watching below the frame. After the end. Kathy. There's definitely stuff. It's, there's a set culture where to stand, where not to stand, when to talk, when not to talk. And then I feel like there's like a very specific culture when it comes to TV and film puppetry, um, because you guys have like a shared language, like in terms of how shots or edits work. There's like monitor etiquette. There's just like all these like ways to be on set that you're not going to get from just learning, you know, in a vacuum, um, because it really is such like a, a team effort. And then also just like, seeing how everybody operates differently is really interesting. And I I think that that is also valuable for us who are usually uh, working as the performers assist, like seeing what everybody's styles are as well. And it's not something that you're going to get from teaching, but just by watching them actually working. Good. Spencer. Uh, I I think I like to think of it as almost approaching it from a, like a macro level or zoomed out or, or director's eye. It's like, how does, how does the show get made? 
what are what are the steps to get the show made how is that happening on set and then how what is my role what is my cog in the machine and how can i make sure that i'm eliminating any obstacles that would get in the way of my tiny tiny part being successful um and so like really approaching it as a as a performer and 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 you know, there's a there's a tendency like, oh, I'm not playing, you know, if I'm not playing a central character, I can kind of turn off my actor's brain. But really, if you come into it, like those days, I don't know about the rest of you all, but like when, when we leave after days of observing, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm like mentally wiped because there's there's so there's so many things to learn. And and then when you get thrown a character, when you get tossed into an opportunity, um, there's that many more things that you don't have to worry about. You already know that you're going to have to clear that cable. You know where the monitor needs to go. You know how Barb is going to approach you. You know, like there's all, there's so many variables in this kind of work. So I feel like every damn there observing, I'm, I'm able to kind of be more aware of those variables so I can focus on the performance or whatever that beat is that I'm trying, I'm trying to do. Nice. Spencer, you mentioned characters and some of you've gotten to play characters on Sesame Street, whether it's actually on the street itself or in social impact programs, uh, projects and specials, or even at our CNN town halls. So uh, real quick, I'd like you to tell us the character that you've gotten to play and for what project that was. And just tell me a little bit about that character. I'll start uh, with, with Tao. Uh, yeah, so I, I play this character named Tamir, who's a brand new character that is, was created to talk about racism and how it affects communities and, and individuals. And this character is uh, an eight-year-old boy, eight-year-old black boy. He's very um, positive. I think he, he has a very positive outlook on his own life and, and the lives of the people that he is friends with and, and his family, despite you know the things that he, that he encounters in, the, in our world, namely racism. That's right, Tao. And you did a great job with him. Thank you. It was really nice. It was great to see. I know you, you called me the week before saying you were nervous about it. Understandably, you know, it was, it's a big character and it's addressing a big issue too. And we can't solve the, the issues, but we can help bring it to light a little more and give a little bit of insight. And I think you did a beautiful job with it. Thank you. Tal, you did amazing. You killed that. <laughs> if I have an yeah, right. You. And Thank Tal you. is super smart. And the, the way you just brought so much life and energy in that childlike manner, and you could tell he was super smart, but you could tell he wasn't a 22-year-old Tal. <laughs> he was yeah. a little smart boy who's just trying to make the world better with his cousin. You, you did an amazing job with that. I was, I was gonna piggyback on to Megan's comment because I watched too, and I was like, "Oh my God, Tamir, so good!" And I was just like watching, just like <laughs> this in the awe because it's so nice. There's a lot of little t- tiny nuances. Both of y'all guys, I'm sure we talked to Megan. It was like, man, I was just so impressed with you guys and proud. Yeah, yeah and and Megan was uh, was Gabrielle right in that same special. Can you talk a little bit about her? What you think about Gabrielle? Yeah, without getting too far off topic, <laughs> I am so grateful to play the role of Gabrielle just this entire season of life. I tried reaching out to Sesame Street three years ago and heard back this year from Matt. And the timing just seemed absolutely perfect because I feel like this year is a year that I really needed the support and to see the culture of, of Sesame Workshop and see an organization being so proactive to respond to issues like this and not just respond to them, but take it as an opportunity to teach children. Because honestly, since you know all of the incidents that happened um, with law enforcement earlier this year and up to this date, I've been so anxious about you know what am I going to tell my son when he's old enough to, you know, to really understand these concepts? And here I am getting to help put that together, (laughs) things that he can watch. And so I'm not going to cry. I have pregnancy hormones. (laughs) 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 But no, I'm so grateful for Gabrielle and to have the opportunity to mold it from from a parent's perspective. How would I want a six-year-old girl to talk to my girl or my daughter or my son about racism. And so Gabrielle is a six-year-old girl (laughs) on 123 Sesame Street (laughs) um, who's just helping her cousin. And I really feel like she's a young activist, but still has a a youthful playfulness. And um, when I was first introduced to her, I kind of watched old um, tape of of Gabrielle and her hanging out with her friend Prairie Dawn. She just likes to play and she 
she's just trying to understand the world around her. But now that she's understanding the world around her, she's taking a more active role. And we're going to organize something to stand up to racism. <laughs> so that's what I think of Gabrielle. She's just a, you know, a young girl trying to make her role better. And she has a uh, awesome role model through her cousin Tamir. <laughs> yeah, and it's nice to see this positive and this desire to make change seen through the ki- eyes of of children. So I'm I'm really super honored that uh, that Sesame Workshop does this kind of work and to be a part of it, and also to have uh, Megan and Tal be a part of it as well. Um, let's go with uh, Haley. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, it's. It's just really cool what Sesame is doing with all of these issues. It's really an honor to get to be any part of any of these conversations <laughs> um, surrounding these difficult topics. Uh, but I play Carly, and Carly is part of the, um, it's a two-parter initiative. Uh, she's part of the foster care initiative for, um, for Sesame communities. And then also she's part of the addiction stories that that sesame is is kind of bringing out through their sesame and communities and she's a cute little six and a half year old monster whose mother is going through uh an opioid addiction and when i first got this character to be honest with you i felt really connected to her and i don't always feel that with a character sometimes it feels Sometimes it's just like, oh, just like, just find the thing that connects you to it. Yeah. And, and with her, I really, really felt it. I, growing up in, in middle school, I met a girl who was, uh, her, her name was Mariah and she was a foster kid and she uh, was really tough and she'd been through so much. And I've just thought about her all my life. And for some reason, as soon as I got Carly, I just... Mariah just like popped in my head and I try to honor her story in whatever way I can thinking about her whenever I'm playing Carly. Cause Carly, she's a little, I think she's, she's very matter of fact because she's had to be an adult way earlier than she should have been, but she's also a kid, you know, she's six and a half. She's a kid. And, uh, and it's just, yeah, it feels really special to get to bring her to life. I just, I love her very much. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. I, I just love her. Yeah. And Kathy and Spencer, you guys are part of a family. You want to talk That's about right. that? I get to be Spencer's mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, a couple of seasons ago, they introduced um, Julia, um, Sesame's uh, character with autism. They introduced her family. Mom, Elena, Peter Lentz plays dad, Daniel, and Spencer. You can talk. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, I'm loving this, Kathy. Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I play, I play Julia's mother, Elena. You don't need to know her age. Thank you very much. Uh, she's very warm. She's playful. She's an art teacher, so she's very creative. And she kind of uses that creativity in both um, coming up with routines for her kids to help them navigate everything that, you know, family needs to navigate in a day, but also uses that to be flexible when those plans don't always work out. But in a fun way. I'm still trying to get to know her a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've only done her a couple of different projects and, you know, she'll continue to grow if, should that opportunity come up just with anybody's characters as well. You'll, you know, each time you get to do them, you can add a little bit to your arsenal and uh, get to know them a little better. Spencer, tell me about Sam. So Sam is a real, it's a real joy and a privilege to be able to, to play Sam. I, I've been, I've done a lot of theater work, a lot of live work um, with young people with autism. Um, and probably met uh, hundreds, 200, 300 families, um, and met uh, dozens and dozens of versions of Sam, who are young people who are similar to the duality that Haley mentioned. Um, they, they, on any given day, they either get to be a sibling and a kid, or on the other day, they, they need to be a caregiver. And their families ask a lot of them, and they they always rise to the occasion. They um they become another caregiver for that family, and so much of the attention often goes to the, the young person with autism. And so to be able to give a voice to the sibling to somebody like Sam is just um it's it's an it's an honor and it's a dream. And I think it's it's really important to be able to spotlight. Um, that that part of the dynamic, so it's it's a, it's a joy. Um, and he's like uh, he's a seven year old nerd. He um, 
He wears his shorts too high. He loves <laughs> soccer and science. Um, and he's, I think he's growing into this double identity of figuring out when, when can he play with Julia and when does he need to, need to help out mom? Um, and so I think mm. as we, every, every script that we do, we get a little more comfortable in those characters and we're, we're kind of letting them grow. And it's um, super exciting to see, to see where, where he's going to go from here. Yeah. yeah. What I love about the initiative is that it's, I love that we're bringing awareness to autism, but I feel like some, so many of the themes that we hit on are, are global, you know, just like there's no one textbook definition of um, a child with autism. Um, there's no textbook definition of a child. And so the themes that we hit on about like trying to be, you know, flexible and, you know, go with the flow and change the plans. And, you know, I, I feel like it's uh, applicable to any family really. Absolutely. Uh, Austin. Yeah, no. So, uh, no, I, I only just came on this past January of 2020. So I haven't done any major character okay. things, but I think that some of the fun of the Muppets and Sesame Street is all the background stuff. I know that we know from the old days of the Muppet show, what's going on on the second level backstage, <laughs> things yeah. like that. I know I was having a ton of fun doing things like honkers this season, which have a dear place in my heart. My brother, that was a favorite of ours growing up. So now being able to do that, or me and Spencer had a had a blast in one episode, just holding the two headed monster in the background. We, you know, we were we were cracking ourselves up. Uh, in between takes, of course, we when the camera was rolling, we were all small business. All somebody, business. Somebody came over to us and said, whispered to the two headed monster, "You're not going to do that on camera, right?" <laughs> and then moments later, Marty came over and said, "You guys are doing great. This is hysterical." <laughs> yeah. So we're like, uh, pick one. But anyway, no. So uh, I think that. Even if you're not doing a major, I don't want to say major character, a character with a voice, you don't have a line or something, you're still contributing to the world of Sesame Street and, and it's a living community with lots of different monsters and bears and pigs and frogs and chickens and things. And honkers. Uh, and honkers in that case. And honkers. Yeah. It all has a place. And Chris. Chris, you are the only one here who has taken on a legacy character. Yes, indeed. On my birthday, <laughs> that was yeah. crazy. On my birthday, I got the call um, that was taken over 2019 um, for Hoots the Owl, uh, which is major for me because, I mean, I, I watched him way back on Sesame. He's always one of the characters I watched for the longest time. And um, it's essentially like... I mean, Kevin Clash is like one of my favorite puppeteers. So it's essentially like someone's like, you're playing for the Bulls now. And uh, that's Michael <laughs> Jordan's locker. You can put your stuff in. I'm like, put my stuff in Michael Jordan's locker. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> and that whole process, like just taking over a legacy and seeing the legacy has just been whew, super humbling. Even to be around that puppet, um, you just, just the character itself, you get around that crap and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> the things that have happened with this thing on someone's hand. He, he's like emanates jazz and emanates coolness and this is smoothness to it. And I remember when I was my freshman year, University of Hartford, uh, we had the Jackie McLean uh, Jazz Institute and Jackie McLean, a nor like big legend, jazz legend. He would tell stories about, um, yeah, when I was little, we was having a snowball fight and Miles Davis was there and then so on and so on. I was like, what? And so I know this feeling of being in this community and there's this like this legend or just jazz guy who just comes up and he, you know, he just like, hey, what's up, kids? And he's just on his bike and he's off. And like, and you're like, what just happened? What just walked by? And that's how I feel whenever Hoots is around, like. Oh, he's just there, man. He's just, just walking down. That's crazy. Yeah, well, you guys all do such a great job with the characters that you play. And I look forward to seeing them grow and how they evolve with you performing them. Uh, before we get to the rapid fire questions, I wanted to ask if there was any, any final reflections on being a sesame mentee. Anything that you want to get out there that you haven't said yet. Tao. This is something that I always keep in mind for myself. I, I always compare this whole experience to what it's like being a stand-up comedian. Um, because, you know, the way the, pro, the way it works is, uh, at least in, in this particular uh, experience of ours, that, you know, we, you work on your own for a long time and you try to get your, get your chops up to snuff as much as you can. Um, and that's not unlike a comedian working the clubs and just trying, trying things, constantly trying things. And then, you know, you get invited to a workshop and it's like, you know, playing the tonight show. Uh, 
uh, it's the first first time really getting to show those who you admire what you can do. And then when you get that call, it says you're going to be on this season. It's like Johnny Carson calling you to the couch. You know, you, that feeling, it's like, it's, it's unlike any other feeling. And then from there, you just, you, you sail, or at least you try to. <laughs> and it, it, it's something very special that it's, not everyone can relate to it, but uh, it's definitely something that, you know, at least it's, it's yours. You, you kind of, you feel it for yourself and it feels good. Spencer. I just wanted to shout out how hardworking this group of people is. We, when, I don't think any of us are sitting around waiting for Sesame to call. We were, we were on other sets. We're doing other jobs. We're hiring each other. We're, we're producing, we're pitching, we're writing. Um, so I, I'm so, I feel so lucky to be a part of this group of people who's, who's hustling in the industry. And, and then we get to come to Sesame to continue to develop. Um, I think it's just, it's a testament to how, to how hard you all work. So it's, that's a great point, Spencer. Really great. That's true. You guys do, a lot of you do work in the industry doing other stuff or doing other stuff. Kathy? To piggyback on that, I, I feel like this group has such a weird and specific bond that, <laughs> and that it's, it's so hard to define because we are in such a unique position where we are at the, you know, we're just like at the edge of this very small mountaintop. You know what I mean? And we're right there at our dream. We're co- we have the same, you know, things that make like exhilarate us and terrify us. And it's such a small little club that I feel like, you know, and I'm, I'm so happy that in the last like season, like we've expanded the group because it's just like a bigger family. Cause I remember like that first season that we had the mentorship, it would be like me, Haley, Tao and Spencer all huddled together. Like, is this okay? Can we stand here? <laughs> I mean, it's a dream come true, but also just constantly just, I don't know. Um, you know what? Strike this. I'm done. I'm done talking. I love this. I understood you, Kathy. See, Megan got it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I feel, I feel like we're all very different people, but I feel like more, on more than one occasion, this group has said to each other, like, only you would understand what I'm going through right now, you know? And I'm, it's so great to have each other to support one another. I, I really love this group a lot. Haley. Yeah, I... I totally agree with that. This, this group is just really special. And I'm going to tell a little secret about this group. Sorry, group, if I'm blowing up our secret. <laughs> but um, there's a game that us mentees like to play on set. And I can see everyone's Uh-oh. faces right now. And they're all like telling me not to tell the game. But I'm this telling you. This is when you stop. Game. No, yeah. do it, do it, do it. <laughs> ixnay, ixnay. No, no. But this game came out of a beautiful place because it came out of times where we're all observing and we're all just like, oh, man, like we're, oh, we're just, we're so lucky. And then, and then we, we try to bring us all back to zero by playing this game. The game is one of us comes up with a hypothetical question. This was the first question that came out. What amount of money would it require you to be paid to climb up to the top of the Sesame Street 123 Street sign in the middle of the day and shout out, I'm the king of Sesame Street. (laughs) Now, remember that if you do this, you're probably gonna break the pole, which is invaluable. You will maybe never work again in this business <laughs> because you've just made such a fool of yourself. You've broken the pole, you've interrupted the day, but you may become the king of Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a hypothetical game. And, um, and so we'll think about it, we'll be like, okay, I, I don't know, maybe, $20 million is what it would cost for me to never, ever work in this business again. But then we were asking the question just to each other and Suki, uh, who plays Nina, came up. She's like, what are you guys playing? And we told her the game and she's like, okay, I want to play. I was like, okay, how much money would it take for you? And she thought about it really hard and she goes, I don't, uh, 5,000 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Please share Spencer's though, because he had the best oh, one yeah. this season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The best one. Spencer, go for it. No, somebody else has to do it. I want to work next year. Somebody else. Go for it. <laughs> so we were watching, um, we were observing on set, and Spencer says, How much money to grab Elmo off of Ryan Dillon's hand in the middle of a take and shoot him at the basketball hoop that's set in the courtyard and go, 
nothing but net, <laughs> regardless of whether you get Elmo in the net or not. <laughs> That was that was my, oh, my. personal favorite. This Matt, season. it's an honor and a privilege to be. <laughs> it's to, real listen, honor. though, it's to break. It's to break. The, you know, tension. Like, well, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. You know, we're we're sitting over there with our arms up in the air, trying to do this work, and a lot of times we just end up laughing at each other. It's a really important part of this job is just to laugh and to bring joy and to kind of be kids, and that's what you're doing. Yeah. You're just being kids. You know, you're just <laughs> being a little little sneaky, uh, and I love it. I love it. That's great. So these are some rapid fire questions. Here we go. What is the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Tao. I have a follow-up question. Is this a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a puppeteer or a muppeteer? Because there's a difference. What, however you interpret it, that's fine. Gotcha. Okay. So I didn't come prepared for this, but I think the hardest part is probably uh, maintaining... Mm, yeah, maintaining uh, character it can good. be sometimes. Good, good. Austin? I think the, the drumming of everything. Uh, in the case of the Muppets, you have your hand in the air, you have character initiative, you have script reading, you have monitor and script and eye focus, you have being aware of everybody else below the frame, you have uh, everything. Everything is the hardest part combined. Spencer? I would, I would say going onto a set that isn't Sesame or Muppets, where there's not a culture of support. And so you have to advocate for yourself as a performer and what you need to do your job. That's great. Good. What is the easiest part about being a puppeteer? Haley. Oh, uh, uh, you, you get to play with your friends all day for money. <laughs> <laughs> now it's not having to be seen and you could, you could really be as, uh, big and broad of a character as you want to be uh, without worrying about how your ridiculous face might look. Because when you are puppeteering, you are often like stretching and squashing your face according to the uh, thing you're trying to convey. Okay, here's the next one. What's your biggest strength as a puppeteer or performer? Spencer? Uh, being a collaborator. That was my rapid fire answer. Thank you. That was good. That was good. Chris? Uh, anytime I get to do like uh, musical numbers, either live or to pre-record. I love that. Kathy. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm a pretty good right hand. And I, I also like picking up choreography quickly. What is your biggest weakness as a puppeteer or performer? Chris. Uh, assisting, especially on rods. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and right handing, I'm okay. Haley. Walking. According to Peter Lentz in the 2014 workshop, I look like I'm perpetually riding a horse. <laughs> You've gotten so much better since then, Haley. Also, in my I don't mind, know I talking, have not. You're so good. Ah, ah, ah. What's one of your favorite things about being a Muppet performer? Megan. I don't have to be alone anymore. <laughs> Being a ventriloquist can be pretty lonely, and now it's, you get to be around a team all the time. I mean, hands down, that's the favorite. Kathy. Well, I think Haley said it. It's You get to have fun with your friends, and you get to live your childhood dream. Hello, who gets to do that? Chris. Uh, I like being sandwiched and working with all these veteran Muppeteers, because I usually know that they're going to pad anything that comes my way. So I feel exceedingly like prepared for anything that comes. Austin. Uh, being new to this kind of family where uh, you talk about somebody like Jerry Nelson or Richard Hunt, and it's like talking about Grandpa Jerry or Uncle Richie. <laughs> you know, it feels like family. And going from a fan to, uh, no, that's in your blood now. That's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing. If you weren't a puppeteer, what would be your career? Haley. Endocrinologist. Next. Wow. Tao. Yeah. I don't I would do a, I'd try a lot of different things. Um I kind of already do try a lot of different things. The first thing that I would do, I'd try I would probably try stand up a lot earlier than I have. Spencer. Uh, I love building worlds, so you may be an architect or a toy designer or a political cartoonist. Austin. For a long time I didn't know what I wanted to do except puppetry. There's nothing else I can do. My skill set is very particular, but I think recently I found out I would love to be an ornithologist. Megan. So I'm not yet a full-time puppeteer right now. I'm actually a real estate developer, um, specializing, specializing in finance and um, commercial real estate. So yeah, I have two lives. <laughs> yeah. 
Chris? Uh, I'd be an improv and stand-up comedian. Kathy? I would still be a TV producer. Okay, so Jerry Nelson once said to me, Sesame Street's great. You'll always have something that is your own, though, that you create. So, mentees of Sesame Street, what is that for you? Austin? I have been doing this ridiculous Instagram page called The Unicorn Lawyer, who poses as my talent agent, but he's this, this southern yokel <laughs> who doesn't know what he's doing in the Big Apple. Uh, and I do these silly short videos with him on Instagram. So that's a thing that I've been doing. And also, I just began making these bizarre Frankenstein sarcastic trophies called participation trophies. They're on Instagram. And uh, making weird art of toys that I buy at garage sales and thrift shops and putting a silly label on it. Haley? I'm very crafty at home. I, I do a lot of painting, a lot of wood wood burning arts. I'm really into that. And, and recently, over the quarantine, been learning how to do embroidery. So now all my shirts are bedazzled. <laughs> <laughs> Megan. So um, I love songwriting. I have a new character that's really inspired by all of the talent that I've seen from you all. Her name is Lulu. And she's a, literally a beaver, an eager beaver who likes singing and songwriting. And so um, Lulu is going to have her own channel and songs. So that's, <laughs> that's going to be my thing. <laughs> Chris, I've been making things with my family. We, me, my son and my wife, we do puppet stuff, a lot of puppet stuff. We throw my kid in it every time. Um, also trying our hand at uh, animation. A lot of, whatever writing, collaborating we do in this family, it usually involves all of us and a camera. So, Spencer. Uh, I do a lot of writing. So I'm writing plays and writing TV pilots and, and treatments and things like that. So lately, that's, that's what I've been turning my t- attention to. Kathy. I spend a lot of my, well, whatever free time I have, I I spend with my five-year-old daughter. So there's a lot of crafting and pretend play and story time. And, you know, when I started Sesame Street, I was pregnant. So since I've been on Sesame Street, I've I've been a mom. And (laughs) up until last year, I, you know, was still working full-time as a TV producer. And so I feel in a weird way that my time on Sesame Street is my me time. (laughs) (laughs) But other than that, I've been relearning uh, piano. Tao. I have a lot of things that I, that I like to make my, myself working on characters and stories for uh, this project that I'm working on called Cold Sober, which uh, it's my way of like performing kind of freewheeling and very like no holds barred. You know, everything that I am thinking in my mind, put that on paper and make it into a reality. And uh, that's one of the many things that I want to work on for myself. Very good. Well, guys, thank you so much for uh, joining me and talking with me today on Below the Frame. I really appreciate it. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Ooh, thanks for having us. Having great. Thanks, Matt. It's been great. Really, this really is going to be the lowest rated episode. Oh, no. <laughs> Who are no, you guys? it's not. <laughs> this is going to be fascinating. <laughs> Who awesome. Are these yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having us, Matt. That's Below the Frame. Please check us out on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, Periscope, whatever the socials are this month. I don't know. Our show today was produced by me. Our theme song was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by the Mighty Weaklings. Our podcast artwork was created by Dave Holteen at DaveHolteenDesign.com. The award from our sponsor players for the Yes And ad were Megan Pyfus, Haley Jenkins, Kathy Kim, Chris Thomas Hayes, Austin Costello, Tal Bennett, Spencer Lott, and Tyler Bunch. And the ad was written by Haley Jenkins. Thanks to Tao, Austin, Chris, Haley, Kathy, Spencer, Megan, plus Tyler Bunch, John Kennedy, and my son Jack for being a part of this episode. And thanks to you, the fans, for listening. I'm Matt Vogel. We'll see you next time when we go below the frame. Bye-bye. Go, go, go. Go, go, go.